Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Erin Majerowitz, and I will be your host for this NASA Technology Transfer Program webinar on NASA's Active Pointing Monitor for a Two-Axis Optical Control System. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to note that this session will be recorded and your microphones will be muted throughout the presentation. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box that can be found in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. We will answer your questions during the Q&A session at the end. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Irving Linares. Dr. Linares is a design lead and lead engineer for advanced flight and ground technology and space flight instruments development at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. His research interests include space flight electronics, digital signal processing, dig digital image processing, lossless and lossy data, and image compression, HDTV, UHDTV, JPEG, MPEG, and MATLAB, Simulink RT development. His current NASA, research, NASA projects include precision formation flying and lunar search and rescue. He supported NASA's strategic planning and concept definition studies for many national and international proposals and is an inventor on three patents. Following Dr. Linares' presentation, Mr. Eric McGill will be giving a brief talk on how NASA licenses technology to outside organizations. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Linares. Thank you very much. Let me uh, get this thing moving. So um, the topic today has to do with uh, uh, an internal research and development uh, project that we um, usually have before a big mission is uh, flown. So there, as you may surmise, there are many elements to going to satellite from propulsion to communications to the actual science that needs to be uh, performed. So this particular um, investigation had to do with the uh, uh, stabilization of the imaging uh, for a spectrometer. And uh, after searching for many uh, technologies, um, the design team decided that this was a very promising technology and we just uh, spent uh, about a year uh, developing it. And uh, we came up with uh, two uh, tests, two, two test sets, one using uh, MATLAB and then we move into Simulink, hoping to have a real-time response that, that would represent a real flight system. So um, as I mentioned, these are my uh, interests. And uh, I'd like to mention that the uh, principal investigator for this uh, study or, or development was uh, Dr. Antonio Manino at Goddard Space Flight Center. And I had the pleasure to work with uh, three uh, other co-inventors, uh, James Smith, uh, Kathy Marks, and Peter Shu. Uh, there are some acronyms in the presentation, um, so I'd like to mention them just that uh, you're aware of what we're trying to, to describe. As you might uh, know, NASA is well known for a number of long acronyms and too many of them. So. We just mentioned a few. Uh, the purpose of this discussion is the CODI uh, mission or instrument. Uh, and that stands for Coastal Ecosystems Dynamic Imager. Uh, we were part of the Earth of Urban System uh, proposals. Uh, we were trying to propose to that uh, large system uh, we use fast steering mirrors in the development, and we the, the Cody was going to be part of the GeoCape um, mission, which is a geostationary coastal and air pollution events. Uh, we use a Teledyne um, uh, detector, and we um, eventually, uh, after we uh, were in the process of proposing. Um, NASA headquarters decided that there were other priorities and there was a mission that uh, was pre previously approved, the PACE mission, which is, in the, I think it's ready to flight. 
uh, which is plankton, aerosols, clouds, and ocean ecosystems. So as you look at these two descriptions, the geocape and the, and the pace, um, you say, well, they basically look at coastal uh, processes, you know, the sea and the oceans and so forth. But the big, big difference is that geocape was going to be geostationary, while pace is low Earth orbit, like uh, 250 miles, like close to the space station uh, orbit. So uh, for uh, certain administrative uh, issues and, and, and priorities, we were uh, not able to continue the development of this mission, but all what we develop is available uh, for you know, technology, uh, further de technology development. So uh, that's the purpose of this uh, presentation to let you know what we did. And if anyone in is interested, NASA will be very glad to work with you. Uh, important things that we're going to talk here. We basically did a proportional integral differential controller uh, in the discrete time domain. So we're going to mention uh, uh, some of that. And uh, there's something called here TRL, which is NASA Technology Readiness Level. Uh, NASA has levels one through nine. Level one is concept. Level two is some sort of uh, better defined uh, system with equations and, and some uh, scientific background. Uh, level three is the first prototype, and you progress through different levels. Level seven is Flight like is we tested with you know in baking uh, chambers and vibration uh, tables and so forth, and level nine is flight is something that is already flying in the in the in space. So we took uh, an idea which was a level two and we were able to bring it up to level three, and that's where we stopped. And the purpose of this spectrometer was to look into a whole bunch of. Uh, uh, electromagnetic uh, spectra from the ultraviolet to uh, think the uh, infrared. So those are the uh, um, acronyms that we probably we mentioning uh, as we move forward. So agenda is the introduction, some requirements for both the mission and the instrument. Uh, we'll spend some time in the lab prototypes, uh, offer results, suggest some applications, uh, go to the conclusion uh, and reference point of contact and questions and answers. So the first chart about uh, requirements. Um, GeoCape was going to look at the ocean color and track rivering as, as estuarine plumes, tides, uh, fronts, and it is. It's just he want to look at the coastal processes from uh, uh, 23,000 miles in, in geosynchronous orbit. The benefit of doing this is that uh, you could do uh, short time measurements. We, when you're at low Earth orbit, you can't do that. You have to wait until the satellite comes back uh, at some other time. Uh, if you are at uh, geo, geo uh, orbit, you could do this every couple of minutes, potentially. So you would have a very uh, um, useful uh, uh, time resolution in the minutes, and you would have very high spatial resolution, which was another uh, pr purpose of, of this mission. So we're going to look at uh, life cycles of the uh, uh, algae blooms, we we're going to look at carbon cycle uh, for climate change impact, uh, look at sediments, pollution, um, hazards like oil spills, and uh, models for ecosystems and uh, uh, water quality and water uh, model forecasting. All those things could have been done um, with this uh, satellite. Uh, these are better defined requirements. Uh, we had a threshold re threshold requirements and baseline or goal requirements. So let's spend a few minutes about uh, the uh, uh, baseline or goals. 
we wanted a temporal resolution of half an hour, um, and uh, we wanted a, uh, a spatial resolution of 200 meters by 200 meter pixels. Currently, uh, pixels are about one kilometer square, so this this would have been uh, four times better resolution. And the highest spectral bands we were looking at went from 340 nanometers to up to uh, 20. 2,135 nanometers. Uh, scan rate, we wanted uh, 50 kilometers square per minute. Uh, spectral resolution, uh, depending on demand, was uh, 0.75 nanometers or 20 to 50 nanometers. We wanted a high uh, signal to noise ratio. And the thing that we really spent a lot of time in my uh, group was ensuring uh, very good point instability. And we wanted to do a tenth of a pixel. So if anything moved, we should correct and bring it back to within one tenth of a pixel. Um, and this, at the bottom of the, this chart, there is uh, an equivalence. And we wanted to have uh, plus or minus one earth second to translate to that uh, half a pixel control from your synchronous instruments. The coding requirements. Um, coding was going to be one of the various instruments that the mission, uh, GeoCAPE mission, would, uh, was planned. And uh, it, as we mentioned, it was going to be a, was going to be a high spectral instrument for co coastal, coastal ocean color uh, science. And the requirement came from the National Research Council's 2007 Earth Science Decadal Survey. Uh, this is something that NASA does every 10 years, and scientists from various uh, uh, universities and government organizations uh, propose missions. So this was one of the missions that, that was proposed by the NRC. The main uh, feature uh, for UK was going to be the geosynchronous orbit. Uh, Cody by itself uh, wanted to minimize the temporal and spatial errors in data, meaning minimizing jitter, uh, which is dip and till, uh, tilt, and uh, raw um, distortions. And we wanted to do that, that on board, not on the ground after we got the data. So uh, we wanted to measure the distortion, correct it, in flight, and then send the data down to uh, ground via the downlink. Uh, so we would have, have studied the coastal oceans where uh, physical and biology, biological and chemical processes react in short time scales. That's what we wanted to measure. So this is a cartoon of the whole system. Uh, one thing that is, um, you know, the feature of this uh, proposal is that we had a laser beam coexisting with the aperture observation. So we were frequency division multiplexing a, a beacon of a specific wavelength and mixing it with the observation in whatever band uh, we were observing. We made sure that that beacon did not interfere with the other lower or higher um, uh, wavelengths. So it was like a specific channel. And the thing is, when when this train of uh, I hope that you can see the the uh, uh, pointer, um, the whole thing moved. The beacon moved with it. So if any, this mirror here, the 330 millimeter aperture moved for any reason, the, this, the scan uh, view along with the uh, reference beacon would, would have moved by the same amount. So the whole train of optical uh, elements went through the collimation, the polarization of focusing, and then through a fast steering meter. 
the fast intermeter was connected to a uh, uh, closed loop controller. So we measured the distortion of the uh, signal and then we corrected uh, with negative feedback uh, using the fast steering meter. So at that point, the uh, distortion was minimized and then it was sent through the through the uh, dichroic meters and then through split into two redundant sites of the instrument, two spectrometers, two detectors, and so forth. So we have a near infrared and a visible uh, near infrared uh, bands and the same on the right hand side. And all this was connected by um, um, electronics that sampled uh, the image and sent it back through the feedback loop. Uh, the next diagram, it's another view of the previous one, but it's it's one side of the instrument, not, not both uh, redundant sides. So here is shown the the input on the left side, the cross track uh, ground scene image, and the particular alignment um, wavelength that we were using was 1064 nanometers. It was you know uh, time divi uh, frequency division multiplexed, sending to the fast steering meter a uh, number of of optical elements. Uh, uh, reflectors, lenses, and so forth. And it was projected into the uh, 2K by 2K uh, uh, Teledyne detector. Uh, on the uh, you know, one, four, three fourths of the detector were uh, dedicated to the spectrometer array. And then on the right hand side, you can see the 1064 column so uh, any distortion, um, tilt, tip, or tilt, or, tip or, or tilt that uh, could have been registered was detected at this particular 1064 column. That's the alignment beacon. And uh, that's the, uh, the uh, sampling that we use for uh, measurement and correction. Um, this is another cartoon that shows that in, in a train of lenses, you will have re relative motion uh, due to the uh, spacecraft uh, movement being caused by, uh, you know, temperature gradients, uh, reaction wheels, thrusters, uh, solar panel movement, all those things in induce some sort of uh, distortion. And that it's integrated into the uh, focal plane observation. So at that particular column, uh, two things could change if we're only looking at two axes. Uh, we have that beam projected into the column on the lower left uh, 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 cartoon part where it says centroid movement. So if you move up and down this beam, the centroid projected into the column will move up and down proportionally. If the beam move left to right or right to left, the length of the projection will change accordingly. And you could have both uh, centroid and length changes. And so the length and the centroid would move simultaneously. So that's the signal we're looking for, and that's what we use to drive the uh, closed loop controller. Uh, this is a more detailed view of that uh, effect. Uh, it's useful to look at the, let's take the tip motion centroid moves, the left hand side, uh, uh, upper side of the, of the chart. Uh, so this projection that looks vertical is rotated uh, 90 degrees uh, clockwise at the bottom. So if you look at these, this thing here, you turn it uh, 90 degrees and make it horizontal. That's the projection that you're looking at the bottom. 
So each one has a rel uh, uh, related projection at the bottom. So the uh, left side shows changes in um, centroid. The length of the of the projections stay the same. The centroid moves a number of pixels. The center one, the tilt motion, uh, the beam moves laterally on the detector, but at the uh, uh, column observation, what you see is, is a change in length, but not centroid. And the right hand side shows when both change the centroid and length. So that's, those were our input parameters. This is an observation um, which is related to the previous one, directly related to figure 1B. Uh, this is what we observed in the lab while using MATLAB. The left hand side, figure 2A, shows the tip axis motion. I think this was a, a low frequency signal, like two hertz or four hertz, uh, when we were doing this. So we were, you know, moving the centroid, you know, gently, um, just for display purposes. And that's how it looked on the uh, uh, length, length, line. We had a camera called E2V line camera, which was a camera with only one row of pixels. I think it was 1,024 pixels. So that's how it looked uh, when display uh, as an oscilloscope where time goes from the top to the bottom. On the right hand side, you have a change in the uh, length, which is related to the tilt axis. And here the centroid doesn't change, but the length does change. And this was again like a, a four hertz signal. Uh, the lower uh, image shows the correction of the system. It basically took uh, in the upper left hand side, we were talking about plus or minus 50 pixels from the centroid set, set point. Uh, it corrected to less than two pixels. Um, so the, the image shown in the at the bottom it's a corrected uh, tip uh, excitation uh, by probably like um, the, the, the error would, would, was uh, diminished to about two pixels. The same if we took the upper um, tilt distortion and apply the correction algorithm, we obtain a similar, uh, very stable uh, um, uh, performance of the of the pointing algorithm less than two pixels. Uh, so we said, okay, um, what about uh, roll? How can we measure roll, and how could we correct so that we have a three dimensional um, correction uh, system? So for that, you need two beams, not only one, and by having two similar beams. Uh, you could measure the change in centroid and length of the projection for both beams. And by looking at those changes, you could determine the role. So in this cartoon, what you see as equal lens is just the initial state. If you roll to the left, the um, length of the projection is longer at the upper uh, beam while the length of the projection at the bottom is shorter. Uh, if you go to the right, it's vice versa. So by looking at the ratios, the length ratios of beam A versus uh, beam B, you could measure the roll. So we incorporated that to the second uh, model. The first one was just MATLAB, and we had a number of uh, uh, analog cards and video cards and so forth, but we didn't have a had a raw uh, system. In the second model, where we use Simulink uh, real time, 
we did have the the third axis um, working and controlled. So this is a description of how we uh, went into the three axis closed loop control system. And these are the components that we had. We had a high power LED source. We have a green light uh, fiber of uh, 200 micrometers. Uh, we had a stepper motor uh, with a, a bifurcated uh, signal. So we were projecting two uh, beams versus one. And then we have a corrective fast steering meter and an independent distortion uh, meter, which would uh, simulate the, the jitter that we were trying to correct. And that portion was uh, driven by a national instrument, uh, USB 6211 uh, generator. And uh, that created the distortion that this guy corrected in real time. Uh, we had a Thor Labs APT motor controller and to, to move the, uh, the uh, stepper motor here. And then we were using the E2B uh, 2K uh, so it was 24, uh, 2044 pixels line, line scan camera. And the whole thing was controlled by the model in the speed goat. And we had some uh, Windows 7. At that time, uh, this was about 2015 when we were doing this. We had MATLAB and, and, and Simulink and the uh, host PC to create the model and download to the speed goal and run it. This, this chart at the top left uh, shows the uh, speed goal screen capture, which is shown in more detail at this uh, slide. So uh, the things we were looking at was, for instance, the uh, length of the first signal and the centroid of the first signal. Uh, also, we were also looking at the length of the second signal and the center of the second signal. And uh, if you look at this little upper image here, this is the bifurcated uh, projection into the line camera. And this is how it was shown as a function of time in the speed go uh, screen capture and this data if, if you take a line across this um, optical uh, uh, illustration you get uh, two spikes these are the uh, uh, length and centroid uh, producing signals in this case, if you look at certain um, height or, or threshold, uh, you measure the, the width of the pulses at this uh, threshold, and you measure the peaks at those, uh, at the base, at the, uh, at the uh, uh, top of the, of the pulses. Uh, so those, Two things would the 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 uh, L1C1 was associated with uh, TIP. The uh, L2C2 was associated associated with tilt, and the um, relative height of these two peaks produced the the roll angle. So we were able to measure the roll angle. Um, with this system, the, th the three values. So I'm gonna just quickly show some more screens. This is the setup. Uh, we'll do that after this one, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a quick view of the hardware we were using. Uh, the step motor, the fast steering meters, the line camera and lenses, they're here. Uh, another view of the projection of the a laser beam into the camera. And on the right hand side, um, just a quick look at the uh, hardware we we're using uh, for uh, this uh, demo, which was uh, simulink based. 
Um, if we pursue further discussion, there is a model that we can uh, share with uh, interested parties and uh, uh, there's more work to be done, but this was the uh, what we were able to achieve uh, in the time we had uh, available to us. Um, this is the lab setup with a whole bunch of different uh, elements listed on the right hand side. We have stepper motors, LED drivers, um, fast steering motor driving electronics, uh, speed goat outputs, and so forth, Mo motor controllers, and uh, a whole bunch of, of wires interconnecting the, the system. Um, so, coming back to where we, uh, we were trying to do, uh, we just were looking into a proportional integral differential, differential controller for our system when uh, continuous time is described by this equation here, U of T. Um, can also be described by the uh, Laplace transform of this equation. And the whole goal was to find the sweet spot of a critically damped system. This is what we would like. Uh, we would want to avoid over damp or under damp, and, but um, I think we um, were able to get something close between the critically and, and under damp case, as you will see in a few charts from, from, from this one. So uh, what we're gonna show here is the length one excitation and response, the centroid one excitation and response to 100 millivolt step uh, excitation. And for set point, uh, roll set point and uh, step uh, excitation, we're gonna see the response of the roll angle. And also we're gonna have simultaneous tip and tilt and uh, well, another graph showing the roll response. So this is the first case. I'm gonna point to what is called here scope seven, which is where the action is in these examples. So in this case, we, we had a step function with a pulse width of 50%, which is this, uh, what is called uh, the value signal with a set point at a value here. So uh, we couldn't figure out what these spikes were, but you know we went ahead, forge ahead without thinking too much about it. There was some sort of uh, negative feedback spike in this thing. It should have been a square, completely square wave, uh, but we forge ahead and you know. We didn't have a lot of time to do uh, all the, all the uh, corrections that we wanted to do. So this is excitation. And this is what we get when we use the uh, uh, constants for the uh, PID equation for a length, uh, for, for like the, the constant for the proportional length was 1.5, the proportional uh, 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 constant for the integral part was 1.1 and the proportional part for differential was 5. So there's um, a certain uh, suggestion on how to do this and there are some references uh, that we could follow. Uh, we basically did it by hand following that uh, optimization manual uh, process, but there are many more better ways of doing this. So. Um, but this worked for our demo purposes. So if we did that with this constants, we, we got a selling time of about 1, 1.2 seconds. If we tweak those constants in this example, if you compare this one on chart 21 to chart 22, slide number 22, we got a faster response of 0.8 seconds. Uh, but the, uh, you know, the trade-off is that uh, the spikes are probably larger in the second time. It's a trade-off between selling time and how much the system oscillates. So this, in this example, this is what we were able to do. So we, we studied a number of samples. In this case, we changed the 
the um, constants for those values shown there. And so we got a 0.5 select selling time for the centroid one, centroid uh, signal. Um, but you can see the oscillation got a little bit wider. And then there's, of course, a case where you are too greedy and the system becomes unstable. So this is just to show that, you know, there are some limits on how much the PID controller can um, perform. Um, this is the response of the raw um, uh, stepper motor that we were using. So we had a set point of 0.5 degrees and it was as an initial um, value of zero. And so when we apply the step, the system went down in a spike, which was a negative feedback signal, and then it corrected to the set point. Um, we didn't have any filtering or st uh, stabilization additional algorithms for this uh, stage of the development, but that's something that can be done. So you can smooth, smooth out this signal by adding the proper filtering, which would be the integral part of the uh, uh, PID equation. But, you know, it suffice to say that we were able to um, get the uh, roll axis working. Uh, this example here shows both um, um, tip and tilt excitation. And the yellow line is the response of the system. So the, the excitation, the, the error signal injected is the orange line. And the yellow signal is the response of the controller tracking the, the uh, uh, excitation. Uh, so for the length, uh, which is called N1 set point. Uh, this is what we get for the centroid. We get a smaller uh, distortion because centroid is a little more stable than the length when we did this experiment. So that's that's reasonable. But uh, it was shown that the system could track the excitation and correct for it. Uh, in order to do this, we needed to do some transfer functions for the uh, uh, motor controller. So this is just part of the uh, development. And the chart shows that uh, care feeding that was uh, needed. And, and as a snapshot of what we did, we were trying to do a difference equation for this particular controller, which is a PID controller in this format, U of K and there's a description of the terms. So we mimicked that uh, textbook process with these equations. The first one is for the length system. This is the difference equation we use. The second one is for the uh, centroid controller. And the third one is for the roll controller, which all of them uh, look similar. Um, and uh, um, they need different constants as shown in this example here. Uh, these were the um, suboptimal values that we got for the constants for the uh, length, centroid, and roll uh, controllers. This can be optimized. We just didn't have time to uh, pursue that uh, during the time allowed uh, for this investigation. Where what can we do with this? So the idea is to perform spectral peak deblurring. We just want to have sharp peaks in this uh, spectral um, uh, data that we get. We don't want um, sort of blurred peaks that wouldn't give you the science that you need. So that was the main purpose. So any satellite or spectrometer that needs to deblur the peaks due to jitter could benefit from this application. Um, 
So um, this in the second case is real-time imaging. The first one is spectral peak deblurring. You can extend this system for imaging uh, deep blurring uh, in order to minimize uh, ground or you know uh, customer post processing. Uh, this would work for any any um, uh, electromagnetic range, uh, um, you know, range that we are interested in, UV visible or infrared. Uh, the thing is that we would need sort of two detectors. One array will picture the image, and the other would have a, uh, this is one way of doing this, is the way I think we should do it, would be the, the uh, stabilization beacon, the 1064 nanometer signal that we use. So if that thing moves, the whole image is moved, and so you can correct because you know the, the, how much is tipped or tilt. Uh, where you have imaging cameras and spectrometers, which require like less than half a pixel uh, stabilization. Uh, we aim at one-tenth of a pixel stabilization. You could probably use this system. Another thing that could be done is you have multiple satellites uh, uh, which are making a mosaic image and they're flight information. You could have two levels of control. First is the formation flying uh, orbit uh, control. You want these satellites to fly at a fixed distance while circling the Earth or Mars, whatever planet you're pointing at. And so that's the first level of stabilization. Then each one would have, would need its own um, optical train control, you know, the whole um, uh, assembly of lenses and meters and, and detectors. Uh, so this would be, could be part of that. Uh, another typical application could be uh, drones or well, man aerial systems where you want image uh, after control for stabilization. Uh, there is a trade-off of how big you can make the system. Uh, what we did was a lab model. Uh, I'm sure you can do this with one card once you um, spend the time developing the system. But the idea was to demo the concept. So. Uh, a drone could probably have a small card with this electronics and perform uh, pointing control. Um, another thing is you have a, a, an autonomous vehicle. Let's say for um, you want to have a, a, a rover that is going to go into a dangerous area where there's some pollution or gases or something that the humans shouldn't go and it's a rocky uh, area, so it's gonna be moving all around. This is just myself making a, uh, you know, uh, some assumptions of how this could be done. Uh, so the images would be all over the place. You need to stabilize them. This could be done for that kind of, of uh, environment. Uh, so what uh, we were able to achieve in this exercise, um, First, we demonstrated that the uh, line of sight uh, and metrology system, this uh, active pointing system, uh, worked through a combination of hardware and software. And we increased the maturity from level two to level three, which was a modest goal, but necessary one. Uh, we were able to show that for the uh, cadence uh, acquisition uh, time for the proposed mission between 1.1 to 10 hertz, uh, we could achieve the stabilization goals for uh, that rate. Um, we observed that the uh, um, const time constants for the, the fast steering meters and the uh, um, uh, step motors and so forth uh, was in the seconds range. Um, they're sort of massive um, in relation to the optics. So uh, that was to be expected. 
Uh, of course, we would like better, probably close to the hundreds of milliseconds or even, uh, you know, tens of milliseconds response. Uh, we weren't able to get there because of the mass and the inertia of the system. And uh, another problem we had that uh, shown here is the problems with the bit flow uh, frame grabber. Um, what we got from the vendor, uh, MathWorks and, uh, and SpeedGoat vendors, which provide the, the modeling software, it's a frame grabber that we couldn't uh, configure to faster than 30 frames per second. That was a big limitation. And uh, time was up, and uh, we were able to increase that rate. Uh, that was a major drawback, but you know we did what we could with 30, frame, 30 frames per second, which is slow. Uh, we were able to push this system to 2 kilohertz, but we just were getting repeated data because the camera was running at 30 uh, hertz. Uh, so um, that's uh, something that would be necessary for uh, further moving this hardware, which would be a lighter and uh, uh, smaller uh, components so that they respond uh, fast to the uh, mechanical uh, feedback sig signals. Um, we found that Simulink RT was very good for validating uh, what we wanted to do. And of course, we were able to um, achieve the goal of, of demonstrating one of the components that would have been needed for the mission. So um, that was good, and uh, that's something that can be used for future missions or for some um, commercialization of this technology. Um, so, um, you know, the, the effort was well spent, it's available, and we want to let you know that that's uh, the goal of this, this, this presentation. Um, there are some references uh, referring to the mission, um, the instrument, and the pattern that describes this uh, system in more detail are shown here as uh, references. Uh, points on context, myself, uh, Sean Sullivan and Eric McGill, which uh, both will be uh, uh, talking soon to you, are um, points of contact for this technology. Once again, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Take care.